So on Thursday, you got introduced to the fundamental counting principle, um, which basically states that if you are trying to arrange something or make certain decisions, for example, about how your meal is going to be structured or what outfit you're going to be wearing or something like that, to get the total number of possible arrangements, you can multiply the number of options that you have for each piece of it together, right? So if you have like four pairs of shoes and two pairs of pants and five shirts, you want to know how many different outfits can you make, you would go four times two times five. And that will be the total number of different outfits that you can make with those items, okay? If you came in late, please come grab one of these. Um, but what I want to talk about before we sort of get into more of the details is really what is this unit about? What is it good for? When do we use it? Um, what are the different types of problems that we can see? Okay, so this is called counting methods. This unit is called counting methods. And it essentially um, involves problems in which we want to know the number of different ways that we can do something. Okay, so that may mean how many different ways can we pick outfits? Or it may mean how many different license plates are possible? Or it may mean, um, let's say I have this group of students in my class. I think there's 28 of you all together. How many different three group, uh, how many different groups of three students can I make with all of the people in this class? That sort of thing, okay? Um, now, the two different types of problems that you will see are problems that involve something called permutations which are like arrangements, and then problems call, that involve combinations, which are groupings. So what I want to show you to start out is sort of the difference between the two, okay? So let's suppose that someone asks you, let's say you're going to like a potluck dinner, and someone asks you to bring fruit, okay? Um, all right, so let's talk about what are some of the different fruits that you might bring to the dinner. Oranges? Okay. What else? Apples? Okay. Oranges and apples to a potluck dinner. Interesting. Okay. What else? Watermelon. Watermelon. Yeah, I would think more melons and stuff. Okay. What else? Yeah. Grapes. Grapes. Oh, I like that. And I'm going to say green grapes. Okay. What else? Okay. I'll tell you what. We need, I'm going to take out apples. Apples are boring. We need something yellow. Pineapple. Lemon? Are you joking? No. You won't be very popular if you do that. Okay, pineapple. Red, orange, yellow, green. We need something blue. Blueberries. And then we need something purple. What's that? Eggplant. That's not a fruit. It sort of is, though, because it has seeds, right? Um, purple grapes? We could do purple grapes. Or plums, maybe? Plums. OK. So if this were me, there's really only one way to do this. Okay, You bring a nice big platter, and then there's six different fruits, so you would arrange them all in these nice little columns, and obviously you would do it in the color of the rainbow. So you would go watermelon, you would do oranges, pineapple, and then green grapes, or maybe kiwi, that would be good. Um, and then blueberries. And then plums. 
So this really, like, this just makes me happy. This is what I would do. Um, but then there are some people who, to be honest, I don't really understand these people, but they do this anyway. They get a big bowl, and they just dump everything in and then mix it all up. Those are the fruit salad people, right? So they'll throw in their watermelon, their green grapes, their pineapple, their blueberries, the plums, and what's the other one? Blueberries. No, oranges. They just throw it all in there and then they mix it up. So people do that. I wouldn't send them away from my house if they did it, but I would be a little bit judgy. Because, I don't know, this is just so much prettier. Okay? So relating this back to counting methods, this guy is called a permutation. It's an arrangement in which the order of the items in the arrangement is important. And granted, may not be important to you that it's in the color of the rainbow, it's important to me. Okay? So this is a permutation, and that is, gentlemen, an arrangement in which the order of the objects matter. Okay? So we could rearrange these so that it's not the color of the rainbow, and then it would look different. It would be a different arrangement. Okay? Although you still have the same fruit in there, it's arranged differently. Okay? This guy, when you just throw them all in and mix them all up, is called a combination. Now, if I were to throw these in in order of the color of the rainbow and mix them up, would it make any difference uh, if I threw in the grapes first and then the oranges and then the pineapple and then the plums and did it in a different order and then I still mix them up? Would that be a different fruit salad? No. Okay, so that's the key difference. A combination is not an arrangement, it's a grouping. We're grouping a bunch of stuff together in the same bowl. In which the order of the items does not matter. Okay, so we are going to be looking at both of these types of problems um, and then all of the nuances that come along with them, okay? So things that are uh, permutations, some examples of permutations, phone numbers, um, license plates, uh, let me think. Those are two that come to mind. Oh, this one's an interesting one. A combination lock. It's called a combination lock, but it actually should be called a permutation lock. Because if you have three numbers in your combination lock, you have to do them in the correct order, otherwise the lock won't open. Okay? So these are all examples of different permutations. Um, things that are combinations would be something like, in terms of food, Think of everything going into the same bowl, like salad or soup or, you know, fruit salad. Um, but other uh, situations that are combinations would be things like groupings of people, right? If you make a sports team, let's say without positions, for example, um, then it doesn't really matter what order you write the players down, it's still the same team, okay? Um, so these are just a few examples of uh, combinations, okay? Now, oh, Lotto 649 actually, that's also a combination. You just have to pick the right, the six numbers that are correct 
it doesn't matter what order you, put, uh, you pick them in or whatever order they're pulled out of the hat from, you still win if you get the right six numbers, okay? Um, we're gonna be looking at both types of problems. One thing that we're gonna be doing is trying to distinguish whether something is a permutation or a combination. So we'll have to ask that question around does the order matter? Um, so where does this happen in real life? Um, the most uh, common place that we use this sort of thing is when we're trying to calculate probabilities. Okay, so for example, if you want to know what's the probability of winning the Lotto 649, you have to essentially figure out how many different women, how many different winning combinations are there, and then if you get the right one, it would be one out of that total number. Okay, so that's an example of where we might use a combination. Um, but another place actually that they're used are um, things like license plates and phone numbers. Um, you know, when I was a kid, you didn't have to dial an area code. It was just the seven digits of the phone number. You picked up the phone, dialed those seven digits, and it rung through. Um, and then when I was, I think I was maybe in university or teenager, you started to have to add the three digit area code of um, wherever you, you know, wherever you were trying to call. Um, is even if it was not long distance. And that's because cities with certain numbers of people ended up running out of phone numbers because there were so many people who wanted phone numbers that there just weren't any left. And so they had to add additional um, area codes, right? So in Calgary, is it 587? Is that the other one? What is it? 403 is, yeah. So 403 is Calgary and, you know, surrounding areas. Um, and then Edmonton is 780 and surrounding areas. I think everywhere else in the province is, is it 587? Yeah, yeah. So anywhere else, if you need an extra phone number in the province, it's a 587 number. So if they run out of 403 numbers and you need to get a number, you just get the 587, right? Yes? I think they also have 825 now. 825? Oh. Well, there you go. So part of this is because our population has grown, but part of it is that now people just have multiple phones, right? So if you think about it, like when I was young, there were five people in my household. We had one phone for five people with one number. Now, you know, if it were today, you might have six phone numbers associated with those five people because you would have, each person has a cell phone, and then plus some people still have a home phone. So that's a lot of phone numbers, right? So now we have to have more area codes. So that's another example of um, where you might come across something like a permutation. Because you know, it's important when you're dialing a phone number to dial the digits in the correct order. Um, I actually, I'll post this on D2L, but there was, do you guys know the, um, the podcast Planet Money? Has anyone heard of that? Yeah? Yeah, it's, it's really good. It's this podcast that basically tells you about money and finance and all sorts of stuff. But you don't need to know anything about money and finance to be able to understand it. Um, they did an episode once where they tried to figure out if you had all the money in the world, right, would it be worthwhile to buy every single possible lottery ticket so that you are guaranteed to win the lottery, right? So let's say there's, I don't know, five million different uh, lottery number combinations and the lottery is $10 million, okay? Is it worth it to spend $5 million buying every single ticket so that you win? It was a really, really cool, uh, yeah. If you, yes, so, but, but it's not as simple as that because um, there's a couple of things that come into play. Number one is multiple winners. So you have to factor in what is the probability of having two or three winners on this ticket. As soon as you have two winners, you just break even, right? If you have three winners, you actually lose money. And that happens quite a bit where there are multiple tickets that win the lottery, then they have to split all of the winnings, okay? So that's one thing. 
The other thing that you have to factor in is time. How many hours is it going to take for you to buy every single lottery ticket, right? That could take, and, and in reality, in something like a 649 lotto, there's way more than 5 million combinations, right? So let's say there's 50 million combinations, but the lottery is $100 million, right? If you bought every ticket, yeah, you're going to win, but what if someone else wins? Then you just break even. And then secondly, do you have enough time to buy every single ticket? Yeah. I think, I don't know what they are now. They used to be a dollar, a dollar each. So let's say you have, you know, yeah. Let's, I think, are they $2 now? They might be $2. I don't know. My mom always, you, she still does, buys lottery tickets. I don't quite understand it, to be honest. Um, but she's bought lottery tickets for years. And when I was a kid, she used to send me into the 7-Eleven and get me to buy her lottery tickets, which they shouldn't have done, because you have to be 18 to buy a lottery ticket, or 19, or whatever it was. And she'd just say, just tell them to wave to me through the window if they question anything. But it used to be a dollar you know, 30 years ago. I don't know what it is now. You were going to say something. Uh, OK, but so the way the lottery wins is it's, or the way the lottery works Let's say it's the 649 lotto, right? You get to pick any six numbers from 1 to 49. And then if those numbers are pulled, you win. But it's possible that someone else may pick the same six numbers. So it's not like once those six numbers are chosen, somebody else can't choose the same numbers. Yeah. It's a really good episode. I'm going to link to it uh, later on today. OK, so these are the types of questions that we're going to be asking, though, right? How many different ways can we do something? And we're going to follow this up um, in our last unit when we talk about probability. And we're going to bring some of these counting method strategies into some probability problems as well, OK? Um, yeah, there's a lot of gambling, actually. Like, if you, <laughs> if you want to be a professional gambler, which some people do, you got to know your math, man. you got to have a good memory, and you have to be able to calculate difficult probabilities very quickly in your head. Um, it sounds like it's fun, uh, but I don't know if I would have the, um, the courage. To, it's too thrilling of a lifestyle for me, to be honest, to be a professional gambler. OK, so last class, let's just actually look at maybe one of these different uh, problems just to review what you guys um, did last uh, time. Okay, And these were mainly dealing with permutations in which the order matters. Yes? Uh, I just oh, they're just up here. OK, so um, for example, this guy is on page five. This is just a review. Suppose there are uh, six major highways from, from Canberra to Darwin, as shown in the diagram below. How many routes are there from A to D? Okay. So let's say you're traveling from city A to city D by car. And in order to get there, you have to go through city B and city C. And you want to know how many different routes could you take? Okay, how would we figure out that problem? What do you think? What are the sort of different, if we were to break this journey into parts, how would you describe each part? We start in city A, then what? Then where do we go? Yeah, then we go to city B. So what I like to do with these problems is for every place where I have to sort of make a decision, like for example, how am I going to get from A to B? I put a space, okay? So in this situation, I have three spaces because I've got three decisions to make. How am I going to get from A to B? How am I going to get from B to C? And how am I going to get from C to D? 
Okay? So how many options do I have to get from A to B? Three. How many options do I have to get from B to C? Four. And how many options do I have to get from C to D? Six. So these get multiplied together to get my total number of roots from A to D. So I think, I don't know, I think that's 72, but doesn't really matter. I'm not so interested in the final number. I want to see the process, okay? So with a permutation problem in which order matters, I personally like to set up spaces in which each of the objects is going to go that needs to be arranged. And then in the space, you're going to put in the number of options that you have to fill that space. Okay. Um, let's look at this guy. How many ways can you arrange the letters in the word flames? And let's suppose that you have to arrange them all. Okay. How many letters do I have to work with here? Six. So I've got to arrange six letters. I'm going to set up six spaces. Okay. How many options do I have to put the first letter? Six. I've got all six letters. I can put any one of them there. Okay. What about the second letter? Five, because I've used one of them up already. Exactly. So this is five. Third letter? Yeah. Three, two, and one. Okay. So we're going to touch on this either later today or tomorrow, but there's another way that you could actually write that number. Does anyone know what it is? Six times five times four times three times two times one? Yeah. Yeah. Six factorial. So when you see this exclamation mark, it doesn't just mean you're excited about the number six. <laughs> It's uh, basically any number factorial means you start with that number and multiply all the numbers that come before it until you get to 1. So 10 factorial would be 10 times 9 times 8 times 7 times 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. Okay? And because of this uh, situation that we actually just saw, um, factorials are going to come up a lot in permutations. Okay? So that's just a little bit of foreshadowing. Okay, so this is kind of what we looked at last class. Uh, what I want to talk about today, and we're going to, by the way, work on permutations specifically for quite a number of days. Permutations tend to be uh, more difficult problems to solve where order matters than combinations where you don't have to worry about the order of the items. Okay? So, what I want to talk about today are a few things. One of them, though, is restrictions. And this is going to come up a lot. Okay? So a restriction is any time there might be a limitation on the number of options that you have in any particular space or in any particular choice. Okay, so an example of this may be you have all of these different clothes to choose from. You have a certain number of pairs of shoes and you've got a certain number of pairs of pants and a certain number of pairs of shirts, uh, but you really want to wear blue pants, right? If you really want to wear blue pants, then you have to reduce the number of options that you have for the pants piece, right? You may only have two pairs of blue pants, so you have to exclude all the other ones, okay? Another uh, restriction example is you may have, for example, how many even numbers can you make? If a number is even, it has to end with specific digits, right? So it would have to end in 0, 2, 4, 6, or 8. There's only five options for the last digit in that number, okay? Um, whenever there is, an, a, is a restriction, uh, in a permutation, you want to make sure that you deal with that first, okay? So, address restrictions first, 
okay? Um, which means that, that you're going to fill out that space first, and then you can go ahead and fill out the rest of the spaces. Okay. All right, so here's an example. A math quiz has eight multiple choice questions. Each question has four choices, A, B, C, or D. How many different sets of answers are possible for the quiz? Okay, now firstly, does this one have any restrictions? No, no restrictions whatsoever. So part of the challenge actually in some of these problems is to figure out is there a restriction here or isn't there a restriction here? Because sometimes the restrictions that are built in are very, very subtle and nuanced, right? It might be a single word like even and you have to know, okay, wait a second, that is going to result in a restriction. Um, in this case, there are not any restrictions. Okay, so let's say you are filling out this quiz. How many different choices do you have to make? Not four. It has eight multiple choice questions. How many decisions are you gonna make on that quiz? Eight. You gotta pick A, B, C, or D for all eight questions. Does that make sense? Yes, no? Okay, so what I would do is set up Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4, Q5, Q6, Q7, and Q8. Okay, so this is every stage where you have to make a decision. How many options do you have for question one? Four, because there's A through D. What about question two? Yeah, these are all four options. Okay, so all together, I don't know what that is. But it's, there you go, four to the eight. Really, honestly, if you just write that, I'm happy because this tells me the entire process, okay? All right, here's another example. If there are four light switches on an electrical panel, how many different orders of on, off are possible if the second switch must be on? Okay, well, how many sort of decisions do we have to make here? Four, because there's four switches. Okay, are there any restrictions here? Yeah, what's the restriction? Yeah, so this has to be on. There is only one option for that switch. Okay, what about the other ones? How many choices do I have there? Two, all the rest of these can be on or off. So two, 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 and all together, that's eight. Okay, um, all right, so I want you guys to start working on these questions. There's one here, six, at the bottom of page six, and then there's a second one over here, okay? So I want you guys to work on those two and we will talk about them in a couple minutes. Essentially is just sort of amp up the difficulty level. We're going to look at situations where you might have several restrictions. Okay, so here we go. How many even four digit numbers can be made with the digits three, four, five, and six if the digits may not be repeated? Okay. How many even four digit numbers can you make if the digits cannot be repeated? So firstly, how many different spaces do I need here? Four, right, because it's a four digit number. Okay. Um, are there any restrictions? 
Yeah, this has to be even. And if it has to be even, it can only end in certain digits. So if we have these digits to work with, three, four, five, and six, which of those would make it an even number? Four and six. Four and six. So there are two options here. And that's what needs to be addressed first. OK, now we can go back to the beginning and fill in the rest of them. How many options do I have for the first number? Three. Three, yes, because they can only be used once. So I am going to, once I place the even number, going to use one digit up. So let's say I put a four there. Then the numbers that I have to work with are three, five, and six. There's only three options. If I put a six there, the numbers I have to work with are three, four, and five. Still three options. OK, so this is three. And that's because there's only three digits left after placing the even digit. Okay. You almost want to imagine that they're like, I mean, Scrabble tiles aren't numbers, but assume it's like little tiles. If you take one out and use it, there's only three left to use. Okay. How many do I have to put here? How many options do I have for the second digit? Two. two. Yeah, because now I've used two of them. And then the third one? One. Okay, so that's, I don't know, six, 12. Okay. Um, all right, next. How many ways can you arrange the letters in the word cruise if the arrangement must start with either C, R, or I? and end with either U, S, or E. OK. Um, how many spaces? Six, because there's six letters. OK. Any restrictions? Yes. yes, there's two, right? It has to start with C, R, or I. So this has to be a C, an R, or an I. So there's only three options there. And it has to end with U, S, or E. So there's three options there. OK? Now, how many options do I have for the second letter? Four. Yeah. How many have I placed so far? Two. Two. So if I place two of them, then I'm going to have four letters left. Yes. Um, OK, so I would assume in this type of situation that if it does not say letters can be repeated, we assume they can. And the, the thing that I really look at is how many ways can you arrange the letters? So we're arranging all the letters. OK, that's a good question, though. So sometimes you will be told about repetition or not. Um, sometimes you have to kind of make an assumption. Like if you're looking at how many numbers can you make, in a three-digit number, you can repeat digits as many times as you want, right? So sometimes you have to think about the context. Other times you'll be told. Um, yeah, OK, so there's four left, right? Because I'm only going to use one of them here, so I can put two back in the pile. And I'm only going to use one of them here, so I can put another two back in the pile. So all together, because I've only used up two, there's four letters, four options that are left here. And then the rest will be three, two, one. OK? And this is because there's four letters remaining after placing first and last. OK? All right. So I'm going to get you guys to do these three questions down here. And then we'll pick this up in a couple of minutes. Cases. Okay. Now cases involve multiple possible or multiple situations that you then have to consider all of the options and maybe add them together. Okay. So um, the word that you really want to look for 
in cases, uh, when you're looking at cases, are um, things like the word or, the word at least, or the word at most. Okay. Um, sometimes you can also look for less than or more than. It's kind of similar to at least or at most. Um, and that is sometimes an indication that there could be, this could be a case scenario. Okay. So for example, how many uh, odd numbers are there that are less than 6,000. Okay. How many odd numbers are there that are less than 6,000? Okay, so we have to place digits. Now, can anyone see why this is actually a case scenario if we're placing digits 0 through 9? It has to be less than 6,000. Okay, so if we're placing digits, how many, place, how many digits would we place? Four? Okay, that's a possibility. Are there any numbers that have another number of digits that are also less than 6,000? Three. Three digit numbers, two digit numbers, and one digit number. Yeah, there's a lot of different options here. So if we were to divide this into cases, case one, four digits. And then plus case two, three digits. Plus case three, two digits. And plus case four, one digit. So we have to figure out the total number of options in each of these cases and then add them all together. Okay? Let's start with the force with the first case. So if a number is four digits and it's less than 6,000, what could it start with? One to five, yeah. So uh, if it's a four digit number, it cannot start with, no, with zero. But if it's less than 6,000, it has to be 5, 000, in the 5,000s or below. So there is only five options here. Okay. Now there's another thing that we have to pay attention to that's a restriction on this number. What is that? Odd, yeah. So where is the restriction? What place is that going to happen in? In the last digit, yeah. So this has to be odd. So it's got to be a 1, 3, 5, 7, or 9. So there's five options here. What could this guy be? Zero through nine, yes. So this could be anything from zero to nine, and so could this. So how many digits are there between zero and nine? 10. So there's 10 options here and 10 options here. Okay? Now, if this is a three digit number, do we have to worry about being less than 6,000, like any restrictions on the first digit? No, because the highest three-digit number is 999. That's already less than 6,000. Okay, so we're going to have the same restriction in the third, in the last digit, because it still has to be odd. So this is five. How many options do I have for the first digit? 
9. Why is it 9 and not 10? Can't be zero. Just can't start with the 0. So this is 9 options, 1 to 9. And then the second one is 10. That's 0 to 9. OK? Um, uh, third possibility, two-digit number. So again, there's five options here because it has to be odd. How many options do I have for the first number? Nine, one to nine. And then finally, for the one-digit possibility, there's five because it has to be odd. Okay, so these all get multiplied together. And then we have to add them because essentially we are going to have one of the following situations. Four digits or three digits or two digits or one digit. So we would calculate all of these. Um, let me just see quickly. Whoops. Right, this guy would be five. Oh, it's doing this funny thing again. This is five. Oh, it still is not in red. I don't know. Uh, I don't know what's going on here. Oh, there we go. Okay, now it's in red. So this is five. This is nine times five is 45. This would be 45 times 10 is 450. And then this is 25 times 100 is 2,500. So we would have to add those all up to get the total number of odd digits that are, or odd numbers rather, that are less than 6,000. Okay? Um, all right. So we already sort of talked about this guy, uh, or this type of problem, but let's just do this one quickly, how many five digit multiples of five or five digit multiples of two can be made using the digits two, three, four, five, and six if the digits may be repeated, okay? So firstly, we are making um, a five digit number. It's either a multiple of five or a multiple of two. So I would set up, uh, as I did in the first problem, what are my cases, right? So case one, I'm going to switch back to black, uh, is that it's a multiple of five. And case two, it's a multiple of two. Okay. Now I only have these digits to work with, two, three, four, five, and six. If my number must be a multiple of five, where would the restriction be? At the end, yeah. So multiples of five, five, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, either end in a five or a zero. Um, so in this case, because I only have a certain number of digits to work with, it has to be the five. Because zero isn't part of the package, okay? Um, now, how many numbers could I, how many options do I have for the first number? Five, because they can re be repeated, right? So the rest of these are all five. And again, zero isn't part of the mix, so I don't have to worry about taking that out for the first digit. Um, and then case two, multiples of two, uh, where would the restriction be there? The last digit, and what would what would work for the last digit? Three options, yeah. Two, four, or six, because it has to be even. So five times five times five times five times three. Okay, whatever that works out to be. And then, of course, we would add them, because this, it either has to be case one or it has to be case two. Okay? Um, here's another example. Julian is planning a trip from Calgary to Denver. The map below shows the different flight options from a particular airline. 
If Julian must fly with this airline, determine the number of different flight paths, or flight options rather, possible. Okay, so Julian wants to go from Calgary to Denver. Why is this a case situation? Yeah. You can either fly direct or fly with a connection. Yeah, exactly. You can either fly directly there or you could fly through Seattle, right, with a connection. Um, now, you know, if you're like me, you want to fly direct, but sometimes the direct flights are very expensive or sometimes there's less direct flights and they only leave at certain times of the day. So, you know, it's often the case that you have to fly indirect. And in this case, even worse, you kind of have to go out of your way. Okay, but case one, direct. Okay, so if we're going direct, there's only one place, one decision that we need to make. How many options do we have to fly direct? Two. Okay, case two. I feel like I can't write this morning. Uh, indirect. Okay, and then in that case, I've got to make two decisions, right? How do I get to Seattle? from Calgary, and then how do I get from Seattle to Denver, right? So this first direct flight is basically you go from Calgary to Denver. Um, in case two, I have to go Calgary to Seattle, and then Seattle to Denver, okay? And I have from Calgary to Seattle, it looks like I have two options, and then from Seattle to Denver, I've got three. So if we add these all up, that's two plus six is eight altogether. Okay. All right. Questions so far? Cool. Okay. So I want you guys to try these two questions for a couple minutes and then we will pick it up again. Of the objects. Okay. So we may have like, 10 objects to choose from, but we only want to arrange three of them or four of them, something like that, okay? So let's look at a couple of examples uh, of those scenarios, okay? First one, a uh, combination lock opens with the correct three-digit code. Each wheel rotates through digits one to eight. Each digit can only be used once in a code. How many different codes are possible? Okay, so we've got eight different digits to use here. But how many are we going to be using? Three. So we're only arranging three. Okay. How many choices do we have for the first uh, number in the code? Eight. And then the second one? And then six. Yeah, and these cannot be repeated. So it's just eight times seven times six. Okay, so this would be a situation where we have eight objects to choose from but we are only permuting three of them. Permuting is another word for arrange. Or arrange, not range, but arranging something. We're only arranging three of them, okay? Um, just to foreshadow into what's coming next, this could be written as 8P3. We'll talk more about that either at the end of class today or tomorrow. And uh, this P symbol okay, there's a formula that's associated with it that we're going to talk about. Um, but essentially it's we have n objects to arrange, but we're only arranging R of them. Okay, so we have eight objects to arrange, we're arranging three of them. Okay, that's essentially what it means. We're going to talk about mathematically how this would work numerically, either at the end of class today or possibly tomorrow, okay? All right, next, how many three-letter arrangements can be made from the letters in the word trouble? How many letters do we have to choose from? Seven, yes. We're only arranging three of them, okay? How many options do we have for the first letter? Seven, and then six, and then five. So using permutation notation, we could write this as 7P3. 
three. We have seven objects to arrange, but we're only arranging three of them. Okay. Um, all right. So I think we'll finish off with these three questions. Your homework is over here. So I want you to work on these for the next five, ten minutes. We'll talk about them if we need to. And then starting tomorrow, we'll talk about all of these formulas that I just alluded to and like more about the factorial notation and that sort of thing. Okay. <laughs>